It's always a pleasure to have you, brothers and sisters in faith. Today, inshallah, we'll be hearing from Sister Kathy Manley, attorney for the human rights and representing Brother Yassin Arif, a dear friend of mine, and uh, one of the most active people, Salam Project in Albany, New York, and uh, Dr. Mel, which is very well known for working locally and nationally with the human rights. Um, and without further ado, we're going to start the program with the video first. Sure, PowerPoint. Salam alaikum. Really happy to be here. Thank you, Hakim, for everything you do for us. Uh, I say, they said Kathy Manny will be speaking soon about the favorite recipes of, from the FBI terrorist cookbook. Uh, <laughs> but before we start, before I turn over to her, I was going to just a little history. See, I'm not even, excuse my technical. Okay, so most of you remember this man. I'm sure, because this was my first uh, uh, terrorist trial, and it was you know, really enlightening and shocking, actually. It was like going down into the rabbit hole every day. I went to the trial every day and learned a lot about the tactics that the government is using. And so the Friends of Human Rights formed around this case, and that was in 2003. And we've been going ever since. And at the same time, on a year later in New York, you know, Yasina Rep was arrested, and Kathy and her colleagues began, you know, around his case, and Project Salam came out of that. So we kind of kind of have a similar histories. Uh, Friends of Human Rights and uh, Project Salam in 2010, we all joined the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms. We are founding members. Uh, along with, at the time, 15 other um, national coalitions and groups from around the country. And these are some of the members. Um, I know and we're a, a kind of a volunteer organization and we rely on donations and this particular community has been really good and we appreciate it. Uh, but we have a special offer today. If you would if you like to make a tax deductible donation, you can get one of the t-shirts, an NCP step t-shirt for free. So, so look at those on your way out. And I'm going to just talk a few minutes about two sort of local cases. Uh, the first one is Zia Jaggi, and a lot of you have heard me talk about him before. Uh, both the two cases I'm going to talk about, I just, I'm not going to say much about the trials. I run to both of them. I just want to say neither one of these people committed any acts of violence. And neither one is even accused of any act of violence. Uh, Zia, just Kathy and I just saw him yesterday. He's in Coleman, he's in the special housing unit where Sammy spent so many years. And his conviction was conspiring to provide material support to an unknown terrorist organization at an unknown time, at an unspecified place. And the other co-defendants at the trial testified that no, he was not part of any conspiracy. So, you know, what exactly did he do? Uh, and what he did was they wanted him to reach a plea deal. They wanted him to confess to something he did not do. And they wanted him to testify against the other co-defendants. He refused to do that. And so he got sentenced to 31 years. And currently he is in, in the special housing unit, which is a, it's a very crowded cell. Sometimes you have a cellmate, sometimes you're in total solitary. Right now he's in solitary. He's been there since a year ago, October. Uh, the government uses different excuses. Uh, they're investigating him to send him to this prison, investigating him for another prison. Every new investigation, they can keep him for the no another 90 days. So he's been there a long time, and I don't see not any real signs of him getting out of there unless he is transferred to another prison. In which case, he'll be going back into solitary for at least a few weeks. Okay, so that's, that's the end. And he's somebody we worked a lot with. We're trying to do something about the case. The other one I want to talk about is our local person, Sammy Osmukak. This one is a little bit different. Uh, this picture is a picture of a cell in the Pinellas County Jail where he was being held up until a few days ago. And he was, as you probably know, he was convicted. Uh, and again, he was mentally ill. Went to that trial, it was clear that he was mentally ill. 
And it was also clear that he was entrapped by the FBI, who would never have done any of these things on his own. Uh, the trial was unusual because the FBI doesn't normally record things when they're talking, but they did in this case. And so they're recording when they were talking to each other about how do we get Sandy to say the things we need him to say to put him, to get him convicted. And this was played in, at the trial. But the jury nonetheless convicted him. You know, he, had, he had not made any friends around here with some of the things he said because he was mentally ill. So he was convicted and sentenced to 40 years. And he's going to be in, he's been in solitary confinement in the Pinellas County Jail for over three years now. And two of those years were before he was tried. Um, I just want to emphasize that, that is so common in Muslims who are accused of terrorism. They spend months in solitary confinement, sometimes years, before they ever have a trial. And that's uh, kind of my mission right now. I'm going to play a really short video about solitary confinement and what it is like. Yeah, I'm not sure you could read all the, all the fine print, but it's a it's torture that was very commonplace in, in the United States, like, you know, like right here. There's at least 80,000 people in long-term solitary confinement. Yeah, so Friends of Human Rights is, uh, we're trying to basically organize a, a coalition of, you know, interested uh, organizations and individuals who would like to uh, work with us to try to end solitary confinement. And so we're having a, we had a first meeting um, last Sunday. We'd like to have another meeting after this program today. And if any of you are interested in participating in that and giving us your ideas, we would love to have you stay and, and talk with us. And I'm uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, if you have any questions about prisons or solitary or any of these cases, I have a lot of information, <laughs> but I'm not gonna take the time today. But I turned it over to Kathy. She came all the way from Albany, and I'm sure it was very difficult, so the weather is very nice in Albany right now. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks, Mel. Can somebody shut that projector off? It's like shining right in my head. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's, it's really a hardship to come here from Albany this time of year, actually. Oh. <laughs> really, I got to see the sunset on the beach last night. Um, but as, as Hatem said, and I was glad to meet him last year um, because he had been a good friend or is a good friend of Yasinar, my client. Um, and I uh, had been representing him since 2004 when he was arrested in a crazy sting operation in Albany, New York. Yasin is an imam, a Kurdish Iraqi imam who had come to this country as a refugee in 1999. And after 9-11, the government became very suspicious of him for some reason, which he didn't know what that was at the time. And they initiated a sting operation against him, which um, was really, it, it, they didn't, in most sting operations, they get the targets to say things that sound really bad. In this one, they didn't even explain to Yassin that there was any kind of illegal plot going on. They just brought him in to witness alone to his co-defendant, who was brought in only as um, they wanted two people in the plot. They didn't really care about the co-defendant. They wanted to get Yassin. But Yassin's only act was witnessing a loan from the informant to the co-defendant. He didn't know there was anything illegal about it. Uh, it's very complicated, and I don't have time. I'm not really focusing too much on that case, but basically there was almost no evidence at all of, against Yassin in the sting operations. He didn't say anything to show that he knew anything illegal was going on. But what happened was there was a lot of secret evidence given to the judge by the prosecution based on all these suspicions that the government had about Yassine. And um, the trial attorney, my boss, Terry Kidlin, he got a security clearance specifically so he could see all this evidence that the judge was seeing, but he never got to see any of it. 
even though even though he got the security clearance. So there's a real problem there <clears throat> with the law there. Um, and based on the judge seeing all this, he became very prejudiced against Yassine. And he told the jury that the government had good and valid reasons for targeting Yassine, which of course made them afraid to acquit him despite the lack of evidence. So they actually acquitted him for most of the counts based on these recorded conversations with the informant, and then they convicted him for the last count even though there was no more evidence in that count, there was no new information given to him. They were just afraid that maybe there was something going on here because they were told by the judge that the government had good reasons for going after this guy. Um, so it was really, really, really unfair, and that was my introduction to these kinds of cases. And after Yassine and his co-defendant were convicted in 2006 and sentenced to 15 years each, which, by the way, was half of the lowest level of the guidelines, there's guidelines for federal sentences, the bottom of the guidelines was 30 years. It was 30 years to life. Whoops. Well, all right, it was 30 years to life, which was supposed to be the range. But at that point, we had organized a lot of community support. We worked with people in the mosque where Yassin was the imam, and a lot of other people in the community were very upset about this case. And so we, we had a lot of letters and petitions and vigils. And so the sentence of 15 years was sort of a victory, but it was still, of course, totally wrong to sentence two completely innocent people to 15 years each. Um, now Yassine's got, uh, he gets out in 2018, his co-defendant doesn't get out until 2020 because he was locked up later uh, after the trial. But after that case, we started um, learning that there were other cases around the country. And we learned of a case in Syracuse, Dr. Dafir. We learned of a case in New York City, um, say Hashmi. And then um, we started the group Project Salam to keep track of these cases and advocate for the, the people and make the connections between the, the tactics that the government was using. And in 2010, as Mel said, we started, um, we helped start the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms, which was basically the same thing, very similar to what we were doing in Project Salam, but on a national level. And, but it's a coalition of the different groups, uh, about half Muslim and half non-Muslim groups. And I'm uh, the chair of the legal committee of NCPCF. And one of our main projects was developing a database of all these cases. And, um, we published a report uh, last summer based on uh, our database. It's called Inventing Terrorists, the Lawfare of Preemptive Prosecution. What we did for this report was we took a list that the Department of Justice came up with of 400 cases between 2001 and 2010 that they called terrorism cases. And it's interesting that the reason they did that list was because they were trying to shut down Guantanamo, which is a great goal. And they were trying to show that we can prosecute terrorists in our domestic courts and send them away for long periods of time so we don't need Guantanamo. But we knew that Yassin's name was on this list, Dr. Dafir's name was on this list, Hashmi's name was on this list, and we knew that they're not actually terrorists. And so we thought we better look at all the names on this list. And they even had Dr. Duffier's accountant with no connection to anything. Um, anyway, it's, so we did a very uh, complete study of all the names on that list where we looked at the um, court websites for each case and looked at the charges and the different tactics that the government was using and what was actually going on. Were, were the defendants actually doing anything? And basically, um, out of those 400 cases, only four people, so a really small percentage, were actually involved in acts of violence or even attempted acts of violence within the United States. Another nine people out of those 400 were involved in violence or attempted violence outside of the United States. So the vast majority were not involved in any 
actual violence or attempted violence, other than perhaps if you count a sting operation where that's led by the government, that the government creates the whole plot. And um, we analyzed the cases using what we call preemptive prosecution, which means it's a, it's a strategy that it's really the government has said this is their strategy post 9-11 that when people's um, ideologies or religion, and it's basically all Muslims, raises suspicions for the government that they might do something against Americans in the future, they might, then they have to go after them and take them down in some way now. Of course, if they're outside of the U.S., they might drop a drone on them. Inside of the U.S., they're going to look for some way to prosecute them. And federal prosecutors have a lot of power and are very good at coming up with ways to prosecute just about anybody if they want to. And so we found that 74% of those 400 cases are what we call pure preemptive prosecution, where there's no real crime going on at all. It's either a sting operation where people were not committing any crimes to begin with, um, or these vague material support charges where the people had no intent to engage in any violence, or these vague conspiracy charges like Mel was talking about with Ziad's case where he, it was so vague that it, it was a conspiracy to do something somewhere maybe at some point in the time and, and he wasn't even really part of it. I mean, it's, conspiracy is a very problematic law. So 74%, no crime going on. Nobody was killed, nobody was injured, no, nothing was stolen, nothing that we would think of as actual crime. And um, additionally, we had a category that we call elements of preemptive prosecution. And 94% of the 400 cases fall into that category, where there might be some crime going on. There was one case that was insider trading case, there were some fraud cases where people were stealing things with like stolen credit cards online and things like that, but they were called terrorism cases because they involved Muslim defendants whose um, ideology or statements they had made raised suspicions for the government, so they put them on the terrorism list, even though the cases, if you look at them, they have nothing to do with terrorism. Um, so that's 94% of the terrorist cases really had nothing to do with terrorism. Um, and, and we wanted to say, like, how was the government able to get convictions in all these cases when they, most of them didn't do anything, you know? And we came up with um, a variety of the tactics that the government uses, and we kind of broke them down in our report. Um, Sting operations were 21% of the cases, and I'll talk about that more. I'll talk about each of these in a little more detail in a minute. Material support charges were used in fully a third of the cases, 33%. Some of those were also sting operations. Conspiracy charges were used in 40% of the cases, and false statements charges were used in many of the cases. Secret evidence was used in many of the cases. Um, very prejudicial, kind of extraneous evidence that's under uh, what they call Federal Rule of Evidence 404B. It's basically used to show someone's state of mind, like their poetry, song lyrics that they might have posted on Facebook, pictures they might have posted on Facebook. These things are brought into a lot of these cases too. And that's another tactic that the government uses. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about sting operations. That's, as you probably know, that's when the government sends um, an informant, a provocateur, really, who's wired, wearing you know, a recording device, and they pretend that they're some kind of terrorist, and they try to get often very vulnerable young men who may be mentally ill or have uh, maybe low IQ, maybe you know, mentally retarded, challenged in some way to uh, go along with something that where they get them inflamed. And, and a sting operation, I mean, it's supposed to be used, or was used in the past, in cases where people are already engaging in crimes, like they used it in mafia cases, in some you know, drug organizations, they use them all the time, where they know that 
that drug sales are going up, but the people know how to kind of use the lower level people to do the actual carrying drugs around. And to get to the higher level people, you need to introduce somebody into that group. And so that's what traditionally sting operations are for. And I think it's problematic anyway. But um, now they're using them against Muslims who were not committing any crimes, who very likely in most cases never would have committed any crimes, but they are somehow suspicious of them. And, and by the way, this, this um, relates to something that Dick Cheney called the 1% doctrine, which is if there's a 1% chance that this person might someday do something against the US, we have to go after them now and prevent that. That's the preemptive prosecution model. Good old Dick Cheney keeps popping up again. Um, so they um, target somebody based on these suspicions and then introduce this informant provocateur. And they, they choose these people because they're very good at being deceptive and they're very manipulative. Um, and they uh, very often, of course, they have their own crimes that they're trying to work off. They have, they're facing prison terms or they have uh, prior crimes or maybe they're being faced with deportation if they don't cooperate with the government and, and become this provocateur. Um, and so there's a few, uh, there's many examples of sting cases. One of the most outrageous is the Newburgh 4 case up in New York um, where they sent an informant named Shahed Hussain, who was the same one that was used in our case against Yassin Arif. And this guy is actually a pathological liar. Like, even the government doesn't really like him when they put him on the stand, although they keep using him. But because he lies about everything. It's amazing. Anyway, the judge in the Newburgh case, after he testified, wrote to the U.S. attorney up in Albany and said, you better investigate this guy. I think he committed fraud in your bankruptcy proceeding because he had declared bankruptcy and said he had nothing. Then he came up and testified in the Newburgh case that at that same time period, he actually had like six new cars and like all this money that Benazir Bhutto, the, pres the Prime Minister of Pakistan, had given him and crazy stuff. Like, I don't know what was true, but anyway, they keep using him for some reason and they keep getting convictions. Um, the Newburgh Four, they had sent this guy, Shahed Hussain, into a mosque in Newburgh, New York, which is an impoverished community, an hour or so outside of New York City. And they were um, African-American men who had been recently out of prison. They were sort of Muslims, but they, they had converted to Islam in prison, and they really didn't know very much about it. And a couple of them, I think three out of four maybe, were still using drugs and um, maybe still selling drugs. and. Um, the, I mean, Shahed Hussain didn't know very much about Islam, and these guys knew even less. Shahed Hussain was supposed to be their expert, and he didn't even remember the five pillars of Islam. I mean, so they, and these guys had no ideology. They just wanted the money that was being offered to them. And he found them in the parking lot, because he had basically been pushed out of the mosque at that point. He'd been hanging around there for a year. And the people at the mosque said, this guy's bad news, we don't even want you here. He was hanging out in the parking lot at that point, and he ran into this guy named James Cromedy, who was a con artist. Um, and so they were each trying to con each other. James was trying to get money. These guys had no driver's license even. They had nothing. They had no jobs. One of them was homeless and schizophrenic. And so they were trying to... The informant was trying to con James and then eventually the other three people, and they were trying to con him out of the money. And uh, of course, the informant won that little con game in the end, and they are all doing 25 years, um, which is the mandatory minimum for the crime that they were charged with, which was attempted murder because he got them to have these cell phones, which supposedly they thought they were blowing something up when they pushed a button, but they said that they, um, they purposely made it not work by not wiring them correctly, so who knows. But they got convicted in this sting operation. And um, sting operations are supposed to have the possibility of a defense of entrapment. And it's supposed to be that uh, if the government is has this plot and they're pushing it along, well, they're not even supposed to do that, but that's what they do. 
that you're supposed to be able to argue that you were entrapped. And then, when you argue that, the government gets to show that you were predisposed to commit the crime, and it's supposed to be showing things you have done in the past that show you were inclined to do that. But in this case, there was absolutely nothing they could show for predisposition. But there's this new doctrine called ready response, which says that if you don't back out of the plot, therefore, that shows you were predisposed, which means there is no entrapment defense anymore. And that's something that needs to be reformed. And that's why the government always says, oh, well, these sting operations must be good because the entrapment defense has never won. Well, that's why, you know? Plus all the fear that, that these cases engender in the jury. Um, and, and this Newberg case was very similar to the Liberty City case down here in Florida, where they also um, targeted very impoverished African-American defendants and got them to swear this very bizarre oath to Al-Qaeda, and those guys were trying to con the informants there too, same kind of thing. Um, and then there's many examples of mentally ill um, people who have been entrapped in these cases, such as Sami Oslokak and uh, Siraj Mateen is, is this guy who's in New York City, he's very kind of slow mentally, and he, he was very dependent on his mother for everything, and, this informant, and he was a very, he's a very compassionate guy, um, Siraj, and, and this informant inflamed him by showing him a lot of videos of people, um, basically people in Guantanamo, a lot of pictures from Abu Ghraib, a lot of um, information about Muslim girls who were raped by U.S. soldiers and things like that, and got him really, really inflamed, and so, and then said, well, we got to do something about this, and we got to, you know, we got to take action, and um, he was going along with it, but then he said, well, I don't really want anybody to get hurt, and besides, I have to ask my mother first, and, and that was when they swooped in and arrested him and charged him based on statements he had made that, yeah, we should do something, and he's doing, I think, 30 years, um, so that's the sting operations, there's a lot of them, um, and then another kind of case that the government has brought several, many times, is material support prosecutions against charities, for example. One of the most horrifying examples there is the Holy Land Foundation case. And the Holy Land Foundation, as you may know, was the largest Muslim charity in the United States, had nothing to do with terrorism, was helping a lot of people and one of the groups of people they were helping was civilians in Gaza. They were giving money through the Sakat committees um, in Gaza, which were the same groups that USAID and the Red Cross, I and mean, USAID, so the US government itself, was giving money to these same Sakat committees. And, um, you know, it was desperately needed. It had no, no connection to any violence. That wasn't even alleged. And he brought charges under material support to terrorism law, which um, originally was passed around 1996, but it had been kind of amped up by the Patriot Act after 9-11 and used a lot more. And the problem with that charge, one of the many problems, but particularly, it has no intent requirement. You have to have, you don't have to have any intent to cause any violence or engage in any kind of terrorism. All it is, is if they can show that money that you give, or any kind of support, including yourself, um, or writing an op-ed, or anything, anything, is connected to a group that's on the designated terrorist list, then you can be charged with material support. So, and, and they extended even beyond that, because the Sakat committees were not on the designated terrorist list. And so the government had to show some kind of connection to Hamas, which they didn't really have, other than they brought in things like an anonymous Israeli agent to testify that he could smell Hamas on the Zakat committees. So, I mean, none of this stuff would normally be allowed in our courts, but now it's coming in in these kinds of cases, and then will and has been spreading into other cases, because that's what happens. Um, so these guys, first trial was a mistrial, 
a second trial, they all got convicted. They're serving like 65 year sentences, which is a life sentence because these guys are not young. And they're some of the best people in the community, humanitarians, um, people who are giving of themselves to help others. They're the ones that the government goes after in these cases often, and in the material support of charity kind of cases anyway. And then uh, another type of charge, um, as I mentioned before, is, is conspiracy. And conspiracy charges are very easy for the government to get convictions on um, because once you show any kind of illegal agreement between any two people, you can add other people to that with very, very little extra evidence, any, almost any kind of association. Um, it's very problematic. And, I mean, it's long been said that uh, conspiracy charges are the darlings of the prosecutor's nursery. I mean, this goes back a long time, so this is a tactic that they were able to pull up and use against the Muslims that they want to go after, because it's very easy for them to get convictions. Um, one of the examples, of, as was mentioned, is Ziad Yagi, who didn't do anything. He had this sort of, like, tenuous connection to this guy named Daniel Boyd and his sons, and they had some sort of vague, that in itself very vague conspiracy, it's even that, and he was vaguely associated with them, and, you know, but they pled guilty, and he went to trial because he didn't do anything, he got convicted, and so he's serving 31 years and has been in solitary for a long time, and I got to see him yesterday, he's, I'm glad to say he seems very strong. Because boy, you need to be when you're treated like that. Um, I don't think I would be that strong, but he's he's holding up pretty well, and hopefully he'll be transferred soon. Um, and we're working on getting him a lawyer for the next step in his appeal process. Although it's very difficult um, to do anything once you lose a trial and lose your appeal, your first main appeal. Uh, another case where conspiracy charges were misused is the Fort Dix Five case, which was also a sting operation. But there were um, three Albanian brothers, immigrants, and um, another two people, another one that's Palestinian and another guy. And there were two different informants in that case. And basically there were two different things going on. The one informant was talking to one guy about, oh, we should do something to Fort Dix. And it was very vague. It was, it was just talking and... He drove him over there once and they looked at it, but there wasn't anything specific. And the other thing, the other informant that spoke Albanian was talking to the three Duca brothers about buying guns. They liked guns. They had no intention to kill anybody or, you know, go do any particular act of terrorism. They talked a lot, but they weren't really planning anything. They just kind of liked guns, like a lot of guys like guns. And they didn't even know anything about it. They talk about Fort Dix, which was they, mainly the conversations were in Arabic and they didn't speak Arabic. And so they, um, even the informant testified at trial that they didn't know about that, but they were convicted of that conspiracy because the conspiracies were kind of put together into one conspiracy. It's very complicated legally how they can do that. And, but it resulted in all of them being sentenced to life in prison for a conspiracy to murder somebody, someday, somewhere. Again, very, very vague. And, and these guys are three brothers doing life sentences. Their mother and father have to go and try to visit them all over the country, three different parts of the country. And it's, it's one of the most tragic cases. Um, Another uh, tactic that the government uses a lot is they bring um, false, cha false statements charges, which is very easy for them to do, and, and I would I always advise, especially Muslims, that's why you don't want to go and talk to the FBI, especially without a lawyer present, because they'll call up lots, of, lots and lots of Muslims and they'll say, I just want to talk to you, I just want to ask you some questions, you're not in trouble, it's fine. But what they're looking for a lot of times is to make you into an informant either an informant who just kind of gives them information um, without going undercover, or what they really like is somebody who's going to go undercover and wear a wire and make these sting operations. Um, so one of the ways they do that is they just ask you a lot of questions, and then they say, okay, 
you know, goodbye, and then they'll call you up again a few months later and ask you a bunch of maybe the same questions or similar questions, and you can find any kind of inconsistency, which would happen with most people, and, you know, any little thing, you don't remember something one time, and another time you think you remember it a certain way, somebody you met, or if you're nervous, and maybe you say, oh, I don't, don't know that person, and maybe you met them once, and maybe you forgot, or you're just scared. That's when they charge you with making a false statement. And they don't even um, record these interrogations. They never used to at all. Now they're starting to sometimes, but only if they've already arrested you, which in most cases, they haven't already arrested you. I mean, in the kind of scenario I'm talking about. So they're still not recording those, those interrogations when it would be a very, very simple thing for them to do so. But this way, it's your word against the two agents that are in the room. And it's very easy for them to then say, well, look, you know, I'm afraid you lied to us, and we're just going to have to charge you, and you know, you're going to end up going to prison, but there's a way out of it, you can help us, and that's what they do a lot, you know, or there's somebody who has an uh, immigration problem, they're trying to get their green card, or they're trying to get citizenship, and they'll say, well, you know, that's a big problem for you, but you can help us out, and we can help you out, and they do that a lot, too, so that's how they get their informants. Um, and another big problem that I mentioned before is classified evidence. And that's, uh, they passed the Classified Evidence Procedures Act back in the 1980s because there were people within the government who were committing crimes, like the Iran-Contra scandal, if you remember that. There was this guy named Oliver North who was from up in my neck of the woods. And he and other people like him were, you know, they were committing crimes. Um, involving drugs and the Contras in Nicaragua. Um, and he said, well, look, if you uh, charge me, I'm going to bring, uh, I have all this classified evidence because I work for the government. I'm going to bring it into the trial. and I'm going to show it in my defense. I get a right to my defense and I can bring all this classified evidence in. And then they had to dismiss the charges in some of these cases because of that. So they said, well, that's a problem. So they passed the Classified Evidence Procedures Act to deal with people who had access to classified evidence and then were charged, right? But now, they use it against people who have no access to classified evidence, such as the Muslims in these cases, and they're able to poison the well completely by getting the judge, showing the judge all these things. Oh, and I forgot to oh, come back to Yassine's case in a minute and show the kind of thing that happens. A lot of times this stuff is false. They're giving the judge tons and tons of secret evidence that if you did get to look at it, you would see it's false. And um, one example in Yassin's case was early on before they started the secret evidence, they said he had to be locked up pending trial because he was a terrorist commander. Because they found this piece of paper in some camp that they bombed in Iraq and his name was on it. Well, he's from that region, so it's not strange that his name would be somewhere there. And he was, he's a poet. And, Anyway, it's fairly well known, but they said his name, it said Kak Yassin, and that, that meant commander in Arabic. Well, we said, okay, we want to see that page, we want to check out the translation, and so at that point, the judge said, yeah, give them that page, and they did, and when they did, they said, oops, you know, sorry, we made a little mistake, it doesn't mean commander, it's not even an Arabic word, it's a Kurdish word, it means brother, it's the most common word in the Kurdish language, sorry, but he should still be locked up pending trial. And we said, whoa, <laughs> you know, he got out pending, got out for a while until they did something else, which I won't even have time to go into, but he basically used his diary and poetry against him and um, twisted that around, but basically after that happened and he got out, they invoked the Classified Evidence Procedures Act and filed for a protective order, and then they kept giving all this stuff to the judge, and we never got to see any of it again, and we still have it to this day. But in 2011, Yassin foiled his FBI file, and they actually gave him some stuff. And one of the things that it said, most of it was all blacked out, but one of the things it said, Yassin R, AKA Mohammed Yassin, Al Qaeda. And we went, whoa, this is what they must have been giving to the judge. They thought he was an Al Qaeda. We know he's not an Al Qaeda. 
at this point, he wrote a whole book about his life, we know his family, we know it's false. And I googled Muhammad Yassin al-Qaeda, and sure enough, there was a guy named Muhammad Yassin in al-Qaeda who was killed in 2010. So at some point, they knew Yassin's not him. I think they knew it way earlier, actually. But this is the kind of thing that they were giving the judge, and it was false. And I think that that happens in a lot of cases. That's a problem with any kind of secrecy, is that it's so easy for abuses to happen because you can't check it out. So these are some of the uh, you know, ingredients in the government's terrorist cookbook, so to speak. And you, know, you can get our report back there. We'd appreciate a donation of $10 or more because it costs us a lot to print it. Um, but there's a few copies back there. It's also online. If you go to projectsalam.org, you can download the whole thing in a PDF. Um, or civilfreedoms.org, it's also there. And we have, uh, well, we don't have a lot of time. I always get to the recommendations part and run out of time. But basically, our, you know, some of the recommendations we have in there are to reform the entrapment defense, get rid of the whole ready response standard I was talking about. So predisposition has to really be predisposition, or just get rid of sting operations altogether. And unless the person, unless you can show that the person was already committing that type of crime, that would be even better. Um, the reforming the classified evidence procedures act, the, the law around that to to give the evidence to the defense attorney. I mean, it's a total violation of the Sixth Amendment. You can't confront the evidence against you if you don't have it. You know, and they can get security clearances and they can get the evidence, they should get it. Uh, and also to add an intent provision to the material support laws so that you have to be, they have to be able to show that you were trying to support violence, that you're trying to support terrorist violence and not just, you know, trying to help people, uh, you know, get medicine or something. Um, and also dealing with the conditions of confinement that Mel was talking about. To not have so much solitary confinement uh, pre-trial, it's used to push people into pleading guilty because they're in these horrible conditions and they can't work on their defense and they may start to go crazy. Um, and uh, also post-trial, there's uh, a lot of abuses where people are kept in it for years and years and years. So. Those are mainly our, uh, and recording the interviews that the FBI does, which they do sometimes now. <clears throat> so those are our recommendations. And uh, I guess um, we have a few minutes for questions and comments. Do you ever feel that the government is uh, spying on you and doesn't worry you about that possibility? Um, I, I mean, they probably have all the emails and um, stuff like that. We always, in phone calls, maybe, I mean, I go to visit prisons and they do email with prisoners and they definitely have all of that. I mean, I, I guess I feel like I'm somewhat protected by not being Muslim, that they go after Muslims. I mean, they go after a few non-Muslims, but I feel like, well, be, so I'm being somewhat careful, but uh, I'm not too worried. I guess it could always get worse and they could come after me, but I don't, I mean, I'm not going to stop doing it based on some fear that that might happen, I guess. I had a question. Uh, there was a recent uh, documentary on uh, FBI entrapment cases. Uh, it was hosted by uh, Al Jazeera. And you notice lately in the news, media, a lot of law enforcement is on the news every day now. Everything is viral, basically. So in terms of the cases that you have, have you considered going to uh, media outlets that will take up these type of cases and you know expose them so you can get <coughs> more support in terms of getting this information out? Because yeah. in today's media and communications, um, you, you definitely will be protected. Well, we've, we've tried that, um, and, and I'm glad you brought up the, the Al Jazeera documentary that Trevor Aronson did, um, that was last year around the same time that our report came out. There was also a Human Rights Watch report, similar to ours, and there's also a documentary about the Newberg case that was on HBO called The Newberg Sting, if you want to Google it, it was really good. Um, also, there was another, um, documentary about an active FBI terrorism sting case that fell apart, which I don't have time to go into, but it's a really interesting story. But that 
is going to be at Sundance. It just got uh, accepted at Sundance. It's called Terror, T in parentheses, so Terror slash Error by Larry Cabral and David Sutler. So you'll probably be hearing more about that. Um, but we, yeah, we tried it. Um, we had pretty good media in, in Yasin's case. I mean, it didn't prevent the conviction, but it got more people um, to come out in support of them and probably reduce the sentence. I mean, we do what we can. It's tough. You want to talk about that at all, about the media? But, I mean, it can be good or bad. I just want to name one more documentary. It's uh, called Deported, and that is about our local cases here. Uh, Youssef Matahed and Akbar Muhammad. Abdullah Sharif, and it was, it's uh, incredible, I mean, traveling. So, if you can find that, I recommend watching it. Deported is the name of it. Deported? Deported, yeah. Yes? You talked a lot about, like, what's going on. Is there any, what's called, preventive measure, like, or let's say, a couple days, a few days that should be given to uh, on the is that under attack, okay, to be taught like to the kids, especially from like uh, childhood and like and, and uh, young age, especially in high schoolers, okay, because basically those are the targets, okay, the, like those high schoolers, like uh, college students and just with new grads. Is there any way just to have uh, a cookbook against the cookbook that they have and maybe some recommendations in a very late term, like? Uh, Way so we we might help him maybe this hopefully this may be a project that we can start so to prevent further problems. Yeah, that's a really good idea. We haven't done exactly that. I mean, we do sometimes know your rights workshops about what do you do if the FBI approaches you, but there's also that question of like what do you and who is what do you put out there to these people who might be the, the targets, like you say, and and how do you get them to pay attention? And, you know. How do you handle it in, in a mosque when you're afraid they're, you know, if, you, if somebody's saying something that sounds bad, then do you kick them out? Do you call the FBI? Do you try to reach out to them in some way that that could put, make you a target? It's really tricky. I don't know if, if there's any real easy answer, but um, maybe we could try to put out some materials like that. We, we like to, to speak in mosques about this um, and try to raise these issues, and I don't know, does somebody from CARE want to say something? Because yeah. you, you deal with that a lot. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, part of what we do is that kind of, you know, raise awareness that these are issues that, you know, this, you know, I think being awareness is the biggest part of it, and then obviously having those conversations come down from, you know, not only the community, but from people's individual families, their parents discussing, you know, because I think part of what the government wants is to stifle free speech, stifle First Amendment. This is really the agenda. And what they use is lawfare. So this is an, an inform, This is an actual way how she's describing how the Islamophobia industry and the hard right uses the law to, to put fear in the hearts of any kind of activists. Muslims are just one sort of demographic, but now they've taken these cases and they've expanded it to other people. I mean, t initially it was used just for Muslims. Now it's expanding and government overreach is, is a lot broader than that. And these entrapment cases are a lot more, uh, going to be much more widespread in terms of where the trends are going. Yeah, any of these tactics, if they get away with it in one place, they'll use it in other places. And they started using sting operations against like some Occupy-related anarchists in Cleveland and some other people in Chicago. And they'll, you know, they'll do whatever they can get away with. I think, um, and so we have to make sure they don't get away with it and, and try to keep informing people that this stuff is going on. Um, and um, what? I just want to add uh, one thing to that. There's two members, or I guess one member of our education committee. Uh, they are in uh, New York City, and they've developed a curriculum for middle school kids. It's an after-school program, uh, basically to teach them some positive things to do, because a lot of the youth don't, don't know what to do. They don't know how to be activists, uh, to just inform them. Uh, and if there's people here interested in that, I can connect you with those people. They've been I think they have a waiting list for Justice it. It's very it. possible. Justice by the Pen is their website. It's so you might want to look at that. I mean, it's, uh, it's a very popular program, and they have a waiting list, I believe, last I heard. So you're right. That's what needs to happen is the education of the. What's the website again, Matt? It's Justice by the Pen. Justice by the Pen. Maybe I am missing the basic understanding.
don't think you've actually given us the definition of what is a terrorist. Like you, you have in your statement a lot, but it hasn't been made because you're saying that they're not terrorists, but you haven't given us the basic. This is what the United States seems like that's a terrorist. Yeah, that's that's part of the problem. Is what is the definition? Of what, what can it be? It's like I guess they would say like politically motivated violence. To, trying to uh, intimidate a civilian population would be sort of the definition, but it's very problematic because, you know, it's like some one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter, right? I mean, even Ronald Reagan said that, I think. I mean, it's a really problematic <laughs> definition, but I guess we meant, I, when we said acts of terrorism, I guess we were kind of going along with that definition because we were taking their own statistics and kind of using that definition and, and so even under their own definition, which is itself problematic, uh, only four of the people out of the 400 fit within it, anyway, within the U.S., so. But that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. What's the government benefit of, uh, of making injustice on someone who, who is innocent? Uh, even though I know the government doesn't care about justice, that they use the legal system, but what's the benefit and, and why don't we, when we get together like this, uh, bring somebody from like FBI or CIA to conference them and, and, and let them uh, answer a question. Why, why, why can't we invite them? Uh, to uh, meetings like this? Well, I have been at meetings when they've been there and I don't know how useful it's been, but some people see value in that. I don't necessarily so much, but um, what do they benefit from it? That's a good question. Because uh, the legal cost is, is too much sometimes for some cases, uh, and that's paid by the taxpayers. No, it's fear. Well, I think, yeah. When you have I mean, people fear, afraid, you can control them, yes. and that's what they do. Right? They I think that's afraid. That's the terrorism levels here in airports. Obviously. And that's terrorist terrorist uh, acts uh, itself. The government is actually uh, they are terrorizing. Right. They're intimidating civilians. Yeah, this, uh, this is a terrorist act with violence, with the drones and everything else. Yeah, it's by a state they, and government. But, uh, but they, terrorist, terrorist. they uh, this isn't this isn't really new. There's been cycles of this kind of repression happening in our country before. The internment of Japanese Americans. Um, what you, Palmer raids around World War One, the uh, McCarthy era, the COINTELPRO in the sixties, and these are all times when um, the government uses some kind of war and some kind of group of people that are other, right, as a way to ratchet up the fear and introduce lots of repressive measures, which some people in power uh, benefit from in various ways. I mean. For one thing, that now the, the Joint Terrorism Task Force of the FBI has tons and tons and tons of money and has expanded greatly, and they, they get money based on the cases that they come up with. So it's kind of a growth industry for them. Uh, there's always that aspect of it. Um, it's it's just, but it is a lot about fear, as uh, you said. Uh, I have a tax question in our statement because uh, Ms. Mayor brought up that the, the, the federal government have uh, unique ways of con making convictions and uh, I just want to know what type of legal defense have you established over the years uh, to uh, fight these type of cases because if they're so unique you, gotta, you must have some type of uh, uh, education that has been established for a legal defense to be developed from these you unusual cases. Well, <laughs> it's it's almost impossible. Um, we had uh, a couple years ago. We had a conference where we invited um, the best lawyers in these terrorism cases, and they came to, to Philadelphia. We had a lot of Josh Gaitel, Nancy Hollander, John Klein, Linda Moreno. Really good trial lawyers. I'm not really a trial lawyer, but they are, and they. Um, Tom Durkin from Chicago, they all got together and we talked about this. We talked about what can you do, what kind of defenses can you raise, and basically, of course, they try. And there's certain things you can do, but the bottom line was that they were saying that there's no way to win these cases legally, that the culture has to change, that the law has to change, that people have to be educated that are going to be on those juries. 
that there's no way to win it legally right now. It's really bad. Well, I, I believe that only how you can get this established if we have enough public opinion right. to challenge. That's right. That's right. Exactly. That's why we do events like this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I believe that's good for grassroots organizing, like if you can have people at the bottom working, like that's awesome. But what are we going to do about the definitions or the actual titles? Like how can we change that? I, I, I think what, if, if I'm hearing correctly, I believe that what you're saying is that we need more cultural awareness and cultural exchange so that we're not letting the media dictate how we perceive our Islamic brothers and sisters. Like, we need to have more influence, like we need to know how they are defining themselves, which is the problem that African Americans or the people of color have been having for the hardest time, saying that, hey, no, this is a part of our culture, though you may demonize it, this is actually who we are. Like, that is an ongoing battle with the United States and against white supremacy itself. So. Maybe we can find a way to set our own definitions and push that through the media, so that way it starts to adapt to us instead of us adapting to them. Yeah, that's great. I totally agree with that. Like, yeah, we can't do it by working through Congress right now and getting them. You know, we're gonna, we have to do it on the grassroots level. And, and you're right, change the definitions. Yeah. Is due, due process completely dead? It's pretty. Uh, it's kind of life support. <laughs> it's yeah. I mean. But it's not the first time this has happened in this country, so hopefully we can come out of it. Yeah. Jared? Yeah, how important do you think activism is in building around cases in terms of like winning the cases? You know, let me, you know, this is, and I was wanted to mention at some point right here in Tampa, we actually won some cases. <laughs> and I think a lot of it was a friend of, I think, I don't know, what do you think, Adam? I think Friends of Human Rights was partially responsible. And uh, like their trial, and the other thing that it, it went on so long, and the media covered it. That was really important, and some of the media actually did a good job covering it. And the public got educated. Uh, a next case came up, you know, and uh, you said, "Well, I had one. I know if he would have if he hadn't had the public here, hadn't been so well educated by the L. Arian, you know, that whole trial, a six-month trial." So. Um, did that answer the question? Now, some of these cases have, uh, any of these cases been brought up to the Supreme Court? Have they made, ever made that level? Oh, uh, we've tried. They've turned them down. Um, our case, we tried to bring to the Supreme Court. Uh, they didn't take it. The Holy Land case, they filed a petition, well, most of them, they filed petitions to the Supreme Court and they turned them down. Um, so, and if they did take it, it might not be a good thing either with the Supreme Court being the way it is. I mean, the, the material support law was challenged in a Supreme Court case called um, Holder v. Humanitarian Law Project. It used to be Reno v. It used to be Humanitarian Law Project v. Reno um, because it started under Jan Reno. That's how old that case was. And at that time, it probably would have won if it had gotten to the Supreme Court. They were challenging the definition of material support and saying that there should be this intent element like we're talking about. But the Supreme Court in 2010 said, no, you don't need an intent element. So it's perfectly fine what they're doing. Basically, the dissent was good, but the um, Supreme Court is not our friend right now, unfortunately. I mean, it's been good in some of the Guantanamo cases and a few other things, but... One, the one case that the public is very, very uh, known, known of is the case with uh, Muhammad Ali um, and you know, people not partaking in, in war, and they've used the legal defense of conscientious objector. And you know, I just noticed, you know, when you, when you have enough public opinion and you take these cases to Supreme Court, that's when you know legal defenses can be established. So. Yeah, yeah, it just wasn't, we can't do it right now, we need to build more public support. I mean, we're still trying all the different mechanisms, but uh, certainly an uphill battle. Do you think uh, the, the social networks uh, uh, is, is enough to help uh, this coalition uh, to succeed? Well, it helps. We try everything, you know, we're out on Facebook and some people do Twitter. Uh, um, you know, all the different blogs and websites. So, yeah, I mean, it's a tool. It's 
that's good. But we need to do we need to do a lot more. <laughs> one of the things we do, do you want to talk about the thermal conferences? Uh, well, one of the things we do that's really good that NCPCF has every year, a couple times a year, is um, family conferences of family members of people in these cases. And, and that's really powerful to bring, it's mostly women, because the men are mostly locked up. So the mothers and daughters and sisters and a few men, sons, um, come together um, and support each other. It's a support network and they also learn how to talk to the media about their cases, how to you know, work with their, their local mosque, which in many cases ostracized them just because their family member was arrested. Um, and it's been really valuable for those family members, so that's something that we hope to keep doing, um, as well as things like our database report. All right, any more questions? Because we're gonna wrap it up and get ready for the meeting. If you have time to meet with us, going to take 15 minutes of break and have the meeting for about 45 minutes. Um, so 15 minutes break, inshallah. Coffee, tea, cookies and dates. And there will be um, falafel sandwiches served after the meeting or at the end of the meeting. So you're welcome to attend and have your falafel sandwich. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out. Thank you Mel. Thank you Kathy. It was uh, great having you here. We wish to have you uh, on a monthly basis come visit us and hopefully Ziad will be out by then. Thank you. <laughs>